Okay, so now that um, now that Alan has has introduced the concept of the, the partner ecosystem, I'm very pleased to to have uh, Zamir Mazdi from uh, a senior solutions engineer at Shopify to talk about uh, how Shopify is dealing with with their uh, uh, partner developer ecosystem. And uh, I, I understand uh, Zamir has has been on this program for um, more than more than a year, I think, um, to to help to to drive uh, the success of your, your partner developers. So um, please uh, welcome Zamir. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, and thanks everyone for having me. I'm going to go ahead and start by sharing my slides. Um, so yeah, so today I want to talk to you folks about the developer success program is how we coined it at uh, Shopify, what that is, how we landed on it, and in particular, how you can use the developer success programs to keep your partners connected in theme with the conference. Um, my name is Amir. I'm a solutions engineer at Shopify. I've been at Shopify for roughly two and a half years. And for those of you that might not know who Shopify is and what we do, um, we're actually an e-commerce company. And we were founded way back when, in 2004, when our CEO and founder, Toby Lutka, came from Germany over to Canada, and he didn't necessarily know exactly what he wanted to do. So he thought that he was going to start selling snowboards. Um, he loved to snowboard. He loved snowboarding here in Canada. And he wanted a way to make some money, didn't have a job at the time. But the problem was that everything that he looked up to try to sell products online was terrible. He didn't enjoy it. It was really tough to be able to do what he ultimately wanted to do. And so in true developer fashion, um, he pivoted and he decided to build it himself, fully custom. And really quickly it became evident that what he was building in terms of the Shopify product uh, was more valuable than his snowboarding business. And thus in 2004, Shopify was born. Um, Shopify today is actually a platform for multiple merchants located all over the world. And before COVID, we actually had locations all around the world as well. So headquartered out of Ottawa, Canada, um, but also with other locations from everywhere from Berlin to Melbourne. Or, and I say before COVID because Shopify actually as of March announced that we're fully digital by design, which means that we're going to be a remote company in perpetuity. And for any major city hub where we had an office presence before, we'd restrict down to a single office and it'll be much more of a co-working style as opposed to fixed office space. But those are details that are still getting hashed out. And in terms of the merchants that we serve, it's pretty remarkable. So um, just a couple months ago, we actually crossed the threshold for a million merchants on the platform. Those million merchants do over $200 billion of sales and have presences in over 175 companies, um, countries. And when we started, it was really merchants like Toby in his snowboard business, mom and pop shops, uh, entrepreneurs with side hustles that were trying to start a new business like Tea's Tea, for example, or maybe a coffee shop or bookstore from your community. But really that grew. And in 2010, we actually introduced our enterprise plan offering, which is called Shopify Plus. And we began introducing a lot larger merchants to the platform. Merchants like Kylie Cosmetics, a makeup company in the United States that has over a billion dollars um, in sales. And other really large companies as well, like Gymshark, the Red Bull, Budweiser, um, and really cool companies as well that you might recognize, like SpaceX, for example, one of my favorites. But um, one of the things that I always like to look up uh, before I talk is this particular graph. You might recognize the format. It's from Google Trends. Um, that red line there is actually the search term e-commerce from 2004 up till the beginning of September this year. And that blue line is actually the search term for Shopify. There was a convergence point roughly in 2014 and then kind of uh, split up after that. And today we're looking at about four times the actual search presence as um, the term e-commerce, which I think is pretty cool. But Shopify is more than just an e-commerce product. Um, and the majority of my time today, I'm actually going to be talking about the other half of Shopify, which is our ecosystem. Shopify has an app store, similar to a traditional app store that iOS or Google Play might have, but targeted towards our merchants and a way to extend the Shopify platform. Today, there are 4,600 apps on that app store. And it looks a little bit like this. As a merchant, 
you might come back here to take a look at what some of our different partners have developed. Our partners are anyone from individual developers that are just looking to work on a project themselves to large multi-hundred individual companies that are doing this as well. And Shopify's ideology is we should solve for 80% of all merchant problems. The standard stuff when you're running a business, product management, order management, fulfillment. But every business is also very unique. Um, they have another 20% of things that make them special. And that's really where our app store comes in. And so as a merchant, you might pop back here and you might be interested in looking things up for subscriptions or events or return management. And that's where our app store really thrives. Um, our app store is actually supported uh, by our developer support team. Really convenient name. And I'm going to refer to it as a developer support team. You might have heard it also as a developer experience team, uh, de potentially developer evangelist, things along those lines. Um, I'd argue they're all pretty synonymous. The underlying role or underlying goal of any of these roles is to ensure that the developers or consumers of your API and developer tools have the highest likelihood of success on your platform. And we started to realize that the problems that these developers were facing when they're consuming the shop APIs actually were very different than what our standard merchants were facing. And so we launched in 2015 this team with a single individual and slowly they began to grow as we realized it was a much needed team on in the company. So in 2016, we had three people, 2017, four. And today there's 10 incredible people that are working with all of our partners when it comes to building apps for the platform. I was lucky enough to be on this team uh, just a bit over a year ago, and I spent uh, about a year here working with partners. And the majority of our work was focused around three main parts. One, it was, do we have the resources available online so that when someone's looking to begin using and consuming our developer tools, they can start and they can succeed right away. So this is things like reference documentation, potentially examples, um, all of the basics that you expect to have um, available for someone that is offering an API. Shopify offers APIs in both REST and GraphQL, as well as about half a dozen SDKs. So it's a pretty extensive offering. A REST API has over 100 endpoints. Um, and this team is basically an expert in that space. The second team thing that this team was for is, is troubleshooting. Um, it's inevitable. Anytime you're going to be working with an API, there's going to be problems. Sometimes it's um, the company's fault or the API's fault. Sometimes it's uh, the problems between the, the seat and the keyboard. But really what we're doing here is ensuring that when developers did run into issues, that they had the support they needed in terms of being able to identify what was wrong with their requests, um, potentially how they could change their payloads, what is additional information that we're seeing in our logs that they could value from so that these issues are resolved as quickly as possible and they get back to being productive. And then the last thing um, had to do with handling suggestions. Developers are opinionated in any way possible, and they often use our products sometimes as we expect, but a lot of times also as we don't. And from that comes a lot of really great feedback. Feedback on things like, hey, this is really challenging for me to do because of all of these things. Or, hey, I really think the way you've implemented this sucks because of X, Y, and Z. And so our role was to liaison that feedback and information from our community to our product team and ensure that when we did identify issues or problems with the API, that they were getting resolved as quickly as possible by our developers. So that's what the developer support team meant to do. And when we started off, similar to the merchants that we started serving, it was small developers. It was individuals. It was maybe small groups of people. But over time, that began to change. And today, I want to tell you a story about one partner in particular called Bold. Um, if you haven't heard of them, it's not a problem. Uh, they're based in a, a small city in Canada, in Winnipeg. Um, gets down to about minus 45 in the winter. It's no exaggeration. But Bold was founded in 2013. And they built apps for the Shopify um, app store and ecosystem exclusively. So if I were to search up Bold in our app store today, I'd see something that looks a little bit like this about 110 results, a lot of really great apps as seen by the number of reviews and installs that they have. And what quickly began to happen is that Bold began to scale and grow and use APIs and develop apps faster than any of our other partners and faster really than we were expecting at the time. 
And then in January 2019, something really incredible happened. This article got published that highlighted the first time one of Shopify's partners or API consumers actually raised a, a round of funding to continue doing what they did. And in this case, they raised $22 million to keep building more apps, to grow their team. So their office went from looking a little bit like this to actually looking like this. Um, and Bold now has 100 plus workers, um, probably now remote, not within this office, but working across Canada on some really massive projects and some really massive merchants. And they continue to grow. But as they grew, um, some interesting things started to happen. Those issues that we were positioned to solve as a developer support team or an API support team were no longer applicable to them. When we were talking with Bold, it wasn't about, hey, I don't understand what this error is about, or I don't understand how to make this request based on the examples you've given. They have that technical expertise. The issues that they were bringing up were a lot more about the platform as a whole and the bumping into limitations that were in place that frankly, Shopify never felt people would run into, right? You implement or you um, archetype and you structure your programs and your offerings based on your reference point at the time. And our, our reference point when we began developing our APIs and as well as the accompanying tooling and support wasn't intended for a consumer like Bold that was had multiple offices and so many people working on it. It was much more of those small people. And so they ran into some pain points and they weren't the only merchants or they weren't the only partners. A number of our consumers grew to this size and ran to the same pain point. And when we're working with these merchants, a lot of times working with them through Zendesk, um, a support tool for like email tickets. And I want to share one with you folks today, which really stood out to me. So this is back from February, 2015. Um, you don't necessarily know what the titles mean, but I want to read out a couple of things that I think are important. Um, this one says, this one is actively impeding our work. If we had that API, we could automate a significant portion of our installer jobs away and improve our response time on installs. The next one says, this would make our continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline process simpler. And lastly, is there any way we can work around this simpler compared to production shops? And they don't need to be there in person for you to kind of sense the frustration in their tone as they wrote this email because clearly they were looking for assistance that went beyond what we typically offered. And they were asking more of us and asking more of our platform than we previously had ever given. And I left that last line in there too, because I thought it was important. It says, if you still like to hop on a call, just let me know, we can set something up for sure. We didn't have the infrastructure at the time to just hop on a call. I mean, this was pre COVID and, and not everything was over calls, first of all, but also most of our interactions, like I said, were through email, which meant that there was delays and responses. And a lot of times that had to do with like time zones and other things. And it wasn't a good way to solve real time issues, priority issues as they came up. So all of this amalgamated into what I ultimately call the tipping point, which is in uh, at some point we had, unfortunately, one of these app developers, um, their apps went down. And when their app went down, it actually was installed on thousands of merchant shops. And because of the nature of this app, it took down those storefronts as well. And the kicker was that all of this happened on the weekend. So Shopify is an amazing support team, uh, 24-7, 365, international, multi-languages all around the world. But it's merchant support. It's support for people that are struggling to figure out how to fulfill an order in their back end because they run a store online for the first time. It's not this in-depth technical support that they were looking for at that moment in time. That team, like I said, only really operates nine to five during weekdays and weren't available for this. So we were able to resolve it come Monday when people were back in the office. But by that point, the damage was done. And this incident actually really affected a lot of our merchants and their businesses. And we realized something needed to be done about that. Um, Shopify also does a lot of surveys and gathers feedback from our partner community, those that consume our APIs. And um, this one in particular stood out to me that I quoted here. It says, partners are getting a bit frustrated with the lack of answers and understanding when they report issues to support. Again, our standard merchant support. And this really resonated with me because it gave me like, um, reminded me of all those times that I might call in a tech support when maybe like my internet isn't working for my internet service provider. And the first thing that they tell me is like, have you tried resetting the router? And it's frustrating because obviously, like some of you that are in this conference as well, 
you understand that there's a level of troubleshooting you do before you even engage with someone for additional information. And when, at the point that you do, you're looking for something extra. You're looking for not the basics that are to be assumed, but you want to know, are there any spikes in the errors that you're seeing server side potentially from maybe a PR that went out that showed or things along those lines that can help them identify really what's going on. And they weren't getting that. Enter the developer success team and program. And really what this was, was us going back to the drawing board and trying to identify if we could do it all again, and if we could build with these larger consumers and merchants and partners in mind, how would we build a program? How would we build a support network? And what would we do to ensure success, not just for Shopify, but also for these partners? And really we landed on three things. The first thing is solutions engineering. And by this, we mean, how do we adjust from that reactive support model of stepping in when things go wrong to proactively assisting partners and using our APIs more efficiently? Um, there's a really interesting use case here with Slack, for example. Their API allows you to paginate um, a number of different ways. I believe it's five at the time that I took a look. But not all five of those ways are equal. In Shopify, we used to have two ways to paginate. We had page-based query parameter pagination, and we had cursor-based pagination that basically maintained an index to a data set. And we worked a, a little study where we got one of our larger partners to refactor from that page-based pagination over to um, cursor-based pagination. And the impact that had on reducing the overall number of database reads that all of the different stores that had this app installed combined were requiring actually resulted in several tons of carbon 2 emissions being um, safe from going out in the atmosphere. Very tangible benefits that we're able to leverage just by optimizing how our partners were consuming our APIs. So that's one piece. And the second piece is being able to build with Shopify perspective in mind because Merchants only have, or partners only have, the context that they find in your documentation. They don't necessarily know maybe how this API is changing over time or how other things could potentially really complement their implementation. But getting that expertise would really help overall improve the quality of the applications that are being developed with your APIs. The second piece here is optimization. Shopify has a versioned API. Um, so that means that as a developer, you can rely on a certain stable version for up to a year. and but that also means that sometimes developers are lazy and they don't necessarily want to update until they have to, until things become deprecated. But there might be benefits that are released in these newer versions that the partners and the platform could benefit from if they're adopted early. So this was us working with partners to ensure that they adopt these things as quick as possible for overall platform stability. Um, and also another part of optimization is better understanding our partners by collecting data on their tech stacks and their development teams so that when, when problems do arise, we have all the context necessary to help them resolve it quickly and efficiently. Last thing is opportunity. Shopify has early access beta programs as we release new APIs, I'm sure most of you do as well. And the problem was that we didn't have really a tailored approach on how to do this. Who do we give it to? Who's really going to offer value and benefit the most from this? But by gathering the right data and working with our partners in a more high-touch approach, we're able to identify these people and ultimately allow them to engage in our product cycle that would mutually beneficial for both them and for us. And the other aspect here is also when it comes to net new partners or new users of your API. If all they have to look forward to when trying to engage with their APIs is your documentation. And off, off, honestly, documentation is never as good as it could be, unless you're Stripe. Um, then there's a barrier to entry there. And so when you do offer technical expertise to these people that are interested in coming onto the platform, you're really lowering that barrier and you're making your platform more accessible for more people. Three main components. Do you need to revamp? Is this something... For Shopify, it, we had this pain point for a while. It was obvious that we need to do something about it. But some of you on the in the conference might be wondering if you guys need to consider the same thing as well. Um, and metrics here you can look at are things like the number of support tickets you get or the time to resolution for some of these issues. But really what I wanted to offer was a MVP program for a developer success model. What is the minimum viable product for implementing something like this? And what would those goals be? And it's summarized in the next few things. The first one is, Involvement in product cycle. How can we get the people that are consuming our APIs to engage with our product so that by the time we release our product into the wild, it's polished and it's stable and it's tested? 
Um, it's something that's really important. Most of you might be doing it. If you're not, it's good to consider. The second is an oh shit button. If we had that oh shit button on the weekend when that app went down and those thousands of merchants had their stores um, affected, then we would have probably been able to resolve it much quicker and save those businesses or help those businesses significantly. This is a means for your partners to be able to let you know that something significant is wrong that's really affecting them. And you don't expect them to use this all the time, but when they need it, it's there. Third, better data. Capturing more information about your partners so that when it does have time to help them, you're able to. Again, tech stacks, team information. And lastly, improved efficiency. Shopify, like I mentioned, we run things in GraphQL and I don't think I need to preach GraphQL here uh, like I usually do at parties, but I wanted to give you a simple example. Our objects within Shopify are commerce-based, so orders, products, things like that. And if I, as an API consumer, want to get one property from an order, let's say the notes, for example, this GIF is me scrolling for a long period of time on what the result would be for making a single request to a single endpoint for a single ID. A lot of data, a lot of database rendering from combining and joining multiple tables for information that I'm just going to throw out, significant overfetching. But with GraphQL, this is what it looks like, and this is what I get, significantly more efficient. So being able to improve the efficiency of your consumers by telling them the benefits and working with them to get there. And what does success look like? At Shopify, we, we kind of um, phrase it this way. And for us, it was two things. How can we ensure higher standard of applications built around our APIs? Um, we, don't we don't have full source code control, some of the other um, app stores like Apple, for example. So we need to be able to work with them to ensure that these apps are built well. And second, stronger bi-directional relationships that are beneficial for them and for Shopify, because we can understand how our partners are using our APIs and where we can improve. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks very much. Zamir, uh, I think that's a that's a great link from the earlier discussion that uh, that Alan shared about creating a, a partner ecosystem. And you guys have have built a partner ecosystem, and and this uh, developer success program is all about helping those developers to be successful. Um, I'm, I, I guess a, a lot of people should be impressed with how you how you've done that, and also. I think a lot of companies are seeking to follow your journey as well, because um, previously people would be concerned about their own developers and they're um, making sure that they have they have quality code within within their organisation. Uh, so it's certainly um, a great um, great to understand what it takes to help developers who are outside your organization actually do things uh, with um, and, and build build on on top of uh, of your platform. Thanks. Thanks very much for sharing that. Of course. Thank you, John.